the hearing, called an arraignment. The magistrate had set Randy's trial on the gun charge for February 19, 1991. But soon thereafter, Randy got a letter from the parole and probation officer who had been assigned to his case, one Carl Richens, a man the magistrate said Randy was to obey. Richens' letter stated in black and white that the trial was set for March 20th, 1991. After that, Randy had been shown an article that appeared in the Kootenai Valley Times in which Richens' boss, one Terry Hummel, denied that Richens had ever written such a letter, the letter Randy held right there in his hand. So Randy wondered, how does one believe these government people who lie to you and who lie to the people by lying to the press? How could he submit to any system so evil, he thought? How could he trust these servants of lawlessness? Then he and Vicky and the children had prayed for guidance, and they had received the word, and they sent the word down from Ruby Ridge by letter addressed, quote, to the servants of the Queen of Babylon, end quote, and delivered to the U.S. Attorney Maurice Ellsworth. The letter dated March 5, 1991, read as follows, quote, And judgment is turned away backwards, and justice standeth afar off, and truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. Yea, truth faileth, and he that departeth from evil is accounted as mad, and Yahweh saw it, and it displeased him that there was no judgment. Isaiah 59, 14 and 15. We, the Weaver family, have been shown by our Savior and King, Yahshua, the Messiah of Saxon Israel, that we are to stay separated on this mountain and not leave. We will obey our lawgiver and king. You see, the mighty one of heaven knows his people. You are servants of lawlessness, and you enforce lawlessness. You are on the side of the one world beastly government. Repent, for the kingdom, the government of Yahweh, is near at hand. Choose this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve Yahyashua the king. Whether we live or whether we die, we will not obey your lawless government. And that was the end of the letter. The letter, written in Vicky's perfect script, bore the careful penned signature of each member of the family who could write, including little Rachel, who signed it very officially as Rachel M. Weaver. As I revisit this letter, the word innocent seems to seep to the forefront of the mind, and other words as well, like misguided and childlike and unreasoned. But when I am about to attach such judgments to this naive man and his prayerful family, I remember that his faith and the faith of mainstream America are, despite their differences in substance, still faith. Faith is the desperate gift, some say the divine gift, to the man who cannot see God, who understands only his puny mortal existence, and who is afraid. Afraid, we grasp frantically at whatever twig is within reach as we slip over the canyon wall. Randy Weaver's twig differed from the other twigs to which the masses in America cling, but at last they are all twigs, and he was as afraid as they, as afraid as we, as afraid as I. That I find major aspects of the Weaver's political and religious ideas at extreme odds with my own is not the issue here nor do I either apologize or defend Randy and Vicky's beliefs, whatever they were. But when I hear Randy and his family referred to as cultists, and hated because of that label, hated because they believe differently than most of us, I remember that all believers, whoever they are, and whatever they believe, belong to their own cult. It is only when the cult becomes large enough and powerful enough to dominate major segments of the society that the cult loses its label as cult and becomes a respectable religion. So it was with the original Christian cult, whose cult members were Christ and the Apostles, a cult whose members were required to hide, who held secret meetings under the sign of the fish, and who were reviled and hated and finally persecuted and crucified. The pilgrims were cultists in England, as were many other sects who found refuge in America. America's heritage is rich in so-called cults, some good, some not, but the right of the citizen to worship as a member of a cult, as he or she pleases, has been protected from the beginning. 
the founders admonished that no citizen should be persecuted for his beliefs, for his religion, for his clinging to cults, no matter how obnoxious, so long as his beliefs do not turn to violence. As the months passed, David Hunt, the inspector in charge of the local Idaho marshals, had already determined from friendly weaver sources that the weavers remained so isolated, so resolute, so armed because of their fear, based upon Magistrate Eyre's earlier erroneous admonition. Armed with this knowledge, Hunt wrote the assistant United States attorney, Ronald Hohen, suggesting that simple assurances be given Randy Weaver, that if Weaver surrendered, his home and his children would remain secure. But it didn't take long for Hohen to squelch that idea. He responded that, quote, The areas of proposed negotiation are either not within my power to grant or bind the government, too broad in their scope, or are the type of matters properly addressed in a plea agreement in exchange for guilty pleas, but not mere surrender, end quote. As I later argued to the jury and as the Department of Justice investigators thereafter found, Hohen had been provided an opportunity early on to seek a peaceful end to this horror, an opportunity he had scornfully dismissed out of hand. Hohen's response argues he was not into a peaceful solution. I never saw him when he was. His hard-nosed, hard-lined stance against this frightened little family was in effect to say, Your fear about your home and your kids be damned. You come down and plead guilty, or we'll take you the hard way. And with Hohen's decision, Inspector Hunt had no other choice but to proceed with his plans to capture Randy Weaver. During the long months following the family's decision not to surrender, the Weaver settled in and prayerfully waited for the coming of Armageddon. They attacked no one. They threatened no one. Friends brought them their groceries and their mail, which was already being secretly intercepted and examined by the government. Vicky, pregnant with Alicia was not able to make her visits to the doctor and had become resolved to deliver the child without the aid of doctor or midwife. During this time, the Marshall Special Operations Group, or SOG, had established its automatic surveillance cameras and was carrying on its sneak peek forays in and around the Weaver property, preparing to capture this little man who had, by virtue of his audaciousness, become one of the United States Marshal Service's, quote, major cases, end quote. In response to Randy's elevation to this rare group of murderers, traitors, and thugs, the marshals had concocted elaborate plans for Randy's capture, one of which, after the Weavers had been holed up for more than 16 months, included the kidnapping of Sarah. As the Weavers read the scriptures, women were to be separated from the rest of the family during their menstrual periods, a practice common in early religions and many tribal cultures. For this purpose, the Weaver family had built a special shed, which was to serve as well as a place where Vicky would deliver her child. The small frame shack was called the birthing shed. With this in mind, the marshals had been charting the dates when Sarah was separated to the shed, the same shed in which the corpse of Sammy was later to be lain. This thoroughly outrageous scheme was detailed in writing by the marshals and duly forwarded to Washington for its approval. The marshals had planned to assemble a task force consisting of five teams, including from two to seven marshals each. In addition, there would be a command post with one supervisor, two spotters, two riflemen, and one backup person. The task force would include two technicians operating the main video below, a command post high up on the mountain, one administrative person, and a four-man U.S. Army medevac team referred to as Vulture. There would also be a ruse vehicle manned by two marshals. With this force of 33 marshals and the other backup personnel, the marshals planned to forcibly take Sarah, who had committed no crime, and for whom the government had no warrant. Indeed, the marshals had been quite observant. Their plan read, quote, Based on video surveillance, we have determined that Sarah begins her menstrual cycle around June 1st, 1992. During this time, Sarah lives in the birthing house, as, according to the Weaver beliefs, she is unclean and must remain away from the family until her cycle is over. Continuing the quote, Shortly after all teams are in position at the lower section of the Eastern Trail, Team 3 would, during the night, move up to the area of the birthing house. The team members would then enter the birthing house, remove Sarah Weaver, and take her to a secure area. 
She will be detained and turned over to Boundary County Sheriff Bruce Whitaker. Continuing still with the quote, Team 3 would remain in the birthing house and detain anyone who came out to see Sarah. By the time the ruse vehicle starts up the road, we should have Sarah, Sam, and Rachel detained and turned over to the county sheriff. End quote. After that, the ruse vehicle would drive up, and when Weaver came out to investigate, the teams fulfilling their various assignments would subdue Weaver. In the meantime, at the trial, Assistant United States Attorney Hohen continued his snail's pace but relentless attack on the supposed beliefs of the Weavers. He called witnesses from the Weavers' hometown in Iowa to testify as to the religious arguments Randy had made. He subpoenaed their old friends to testify about how they sold their house and bought guns, and how they trekked to Idaho, like characters out of the Grapes of Wrath, in preparation for the coming of Armageddon. From the earliest time in the case, Hohen sought the death penalty against Randy, surely knowing that no federal law then existing could be stretched to bring about Weaver's execution. And we, Randy's lawyers, were required to petition the court to strike the death penalty request from the case. Sometimes at night I would awaken wondering what would happen if the judge bore the same burning enmity against Weaver as did Hohen. What would happen if the judge ignored the law and the jury convicted Randy? These days one cannot always rely on an appellate court to correct obvious wrongs, for the courts are being smothered with appeals by death row inmates, and consequently death penalty cases are often given short shrift. One can be kept sleepless when a single assistant United States attorney exercises his power to write those few abominable words on a page, words from which emerge terrible visions of the dangling noose, the dripping executioner's needle, the waiting firing squad. One sees them mostly in the night. I never knew what Randy Weaver saw in the night in his small cold cell awaiting trial. I never asked him. In the trial, attorney and client most often fight their own wars and alone. If there was a fact to be proven at the trial, Hohen proved it, along with every insignificant detail remotely connected to the fact. It was as if in proving a box of cornflakes was indeed cornflakes, he would dump the whole box out on the table and then prove each flake, flake by flake, hour by hour. The trial dragged on. I thought the strategy was to fill the jury with so many facts, to dump on them so much hate, so much fear, so much detail that the jury, from such a mountain of corrupted evidence, would conclude that the prosecution had not only proved its case beyond a reasonable doubt, but that it had proven it ten times over. But Horn was proving very little, if anything, of substance. And by the time he was required to establish what actually happened at the Y, where old Yella and little Sammy were killed, the prosecution's case began to crumble. Although Randy was charged with the murder of Deegan at the Y, Randy was not there when the shots were fired. But what if the FBI produced, say, a certain bullet, a bullet recovered at the Y, from, say, a gun owned by Randy Weaver, one the FBI had seized at the Weaver house on the day Randy surrendered? What then? Perhaps the FBI had forgotten that Randy Weaver had been carrying only a 12-gauge shotgun and a holstered handgun on the day the shooting at the Y took place. The bullet that the FBI now produced had been fired from a two twenty three caliber rifle. And how was that bullet found? The FBI claims it found this spent bullet lying daintily on top of some leaves, not buried, not marred or scratched or bent or bruised or dented or otherwise blemished, except, of course, for the rifling that happened to match the two twenty three rifle that the FBI had seized. But it was not Randy's rifle. It was a rifle belonging to Sarah, and Sarah had never left the house. Moreover, for the bullet to travel from the house to the Y, it would have had to magically travel straight through more than half a mile of dense timber without touching, not once, a tree or a twig. And it would have had to land perfectly on top of the leaves, land in such a way as to appear it had been carefully laid there, which is not the known dynamic of bullets as they spend themselves. Think of it. Another magic bullet, like in the Oswald case? We remembered that bullet, of course, the one the FBI seemingly produced out of nowhere during the assassination investigation. It had supposedly passed through flesh and bone and bone and flesh of both President Kennedy and Governor Conley, 
and having done so, it was conveniently found right there in the gurney, pristine and pretty and as utterly unmarked as the day it had been manufactured. In Randy's trial, we challenged not only the bullet itself, but the means by which it had gotten to the Y. Under my cross-examination, the FBI agent who recovered the bullet admitted that he had manufactured evidence that was to later illustrate its discovery. The agent claimed he found the bullet, picked it up, and put it in his pocket. Then he claimed he later thought he should take a photo of it to record how and where the bullet lay when he supposedly found it. So the agent took the bullet back to the place where he thought he found it, took it out of his pocket again, placed it on the ground, and took a picture of it. One would wonder if he could even remember in what direction the bullet had been pointing. The photo, of course, was posed. But it had not been offered as a posed picture. Government officers, our servants, ought not to attempt to put citizens in prison for life based on posed pictures of magic bullets. I thought once more of old Andy Sutka. And, of course, we remember that Lon Horiuchi, who had taken the stand, had testified that, indeed, he had intended to kill Kevin Harris, who was running for his life, his back to the sniper. Yet the prosecution claimed that the sniper, who admittedly could see and hit a fly at 200 yards with his 10-power scope, could not see the head of Vicki Weaver through the glass window of the open door. Instead, the prosecution attempted to make the jury believe that the curtains were closed. But from my own discussion with Randy, that fact seemed in question, especially after the government failed to produce a crucial Horiuchi drawing of what the sniper had seen when he fired. From the drawing made by Horiuchi during an interview with the FBI at a hotel, on hotel stationery, he draws in no closed curtains at all. In the lower right-hand corner of the window, we see two partial heads, as if people were squatting there. Indeed, Randy and Sarah had dived into the house just ahead of Kevin Harris, and it was Harris, not Weaver, who presumably had killed a federal officer and who Horiuchi himself was admittedly trying to kill. Be that as it may, the method of hitting a running target is for the shooter to place a visual reference called a mill dot, which he sees in his scope, on the target. Harris, in this case, which places the crosshairs ahead of the target, thus leading the target so the bullet and the target will arrive simultaneously. Shortly after the killing, this is exactly as Horiuchi himself drew it for the FBI interrogator. Horiuchi's drawing shows us that he must have known that human beings were behind the flimsy door. He had to know that someone, presumably Vicky or the ten-year-old Rachel, was likely standing behind the door to hold it open. Moreover, the drawing proves he knew exactly where in the door he planned the bullet to strike. And that's where it did strike, at the cross, as he shows it in the drawing. Vicki Weaver's head was behind the cross, that apocalyptic symbol, which served also as the point of aim for the killer. When Hohen confessed to the judge that the FBI had withheld his pivotal piece of evidence, Horiuchi's drawing, his honor, Edward Lodge, was irate. A legal as well as a moral obligation demands that the government produce all of the exculpatory evidence in its possession, that is, all evidence that is favorable to the defendant. From the outset, we had told the jury that the evidence would establish that Mrs. Weaver was intentionally shot by the federal agent. The Horiuchi exhibit, withheld from us by the FBI, supported the conclusion that at the minimum, the sniper knew human beings were behind the door into which he was shooting, presumably Vicky. But perhaps the drawing, along with the killing of Vicky Weaver, implied more. That Horiuchi could see where his bullet would strike. That with his high-powered scope, he could plainly make out the most minute detail of Vicki Weaver's head and frightened face. What does a judge do with an omnipotent FBI that will violate the law as well as the rights of innocent citizens by withholding evidence that is crucial to freedom? I suspect that Judge Lodge believed this grave wrong was not the creation of a single person, but was the product of a conspiracy of sorts, among several. If it was likely impossible for the judge to determine who exactly was responsible for withholding this evidence, well, he could hardly put the Bureau itself in jail. And so the judge, attempting to do at least something, sanctioned the Bureau for its misconduct by requiring the Bureau to pay the defense attorneys one day's fee. I wondered whose budget in the Bureau this piddling sum would come from. Betty Cash? The Stamp Fund? The Party Fund, if any? 
Since my son Kent and I, as well as Gary Gilman, were representing Randy without fee, and since we wanted to accept nothing from the government for Randy's defense, not even sanction money, we made no effort to collect it. Predictably, the United States has made no effort to pay it. Nothing but a pretty fantasy supposes that a few thousand dollars in sanction money, which no agent must personally pay, will in the future deter the FBI from hiding critical evidence. Yet the court's order was a public slap in the face to the Bureau. A respected United States district judge had officially found that the FBI will cheat to win a case. Once more I thought of old Andy Sutka. The judge and the jury freed Randy Weaver of all charges except for his failure to appear for his trial on the gun charge. He was in jail for a month or so after the trial, but Judge Lodge gave him credit for the months he had remained in jail awaiting trial, and for the nearly three months that the trial itself had taken. He was released before Christmas of 1993, when he returned to the place of his childhood, the long, bleak, winter farm country of Iowa. With Vicky dead, Randy stayed at home to attend the mothering of toddling Elisheba. Sometimes he lamented the fact that he fell short as a mother. He was and is a shy man. He usually does not want to talk to the press. He does not wish to be a symbol or a hero for any of the far-right radical fringes with whom he says he would likely disagree. He lives on the meager pittance he receives from Social Security paid as a result of Vicky's death. He has not sold his rights to movies or books or to tabloid television. He wishes the death of his beautiful wife and his loving son to stand for something. And he grieves. And he is lonely. And he struggles to forget. But he remembers that he is an American citizen and that the rule of law was supposed to protect him and his family. He tries to understand how in America the servants of the people became the servants of the lawless. How federal officers who are charged with keeping the people safe should become the killers of women and children, the innocent whom the federal police are charged to protect. He wonders how, at last, these servants should become the people's fearful oppressors. Before the trial, and presumably to aid the prosecution at the trial, the FBI did a quick and dirty internal investigation that whitewashed the whole Randy Weaver affair. According to them, nobody did anything wrong. But after the trial, the Department of Justice assembled an investigative team consisting of a number of their top agents from around the country, as well as lawyers from the Department of Justice itself. The report of this team took over a year to assemble and is a massive document of 542 pages. It finds, among other things, that the FBI report was inadequate and negligently done, and the agents responsible for this whitewash were either censured or reprimanded. One was suspended 15 days. Two others were given letters of reprimand or censure, but reportedly had already retired. Ronald Hohen was referred to the executive office of the United States Attorneys, the disciplinary arm of the United States Department of Justice, quote, for whatever action it deems appropriate, end quote. Hohen was criticized for, among other things, quote, significant defects in the indictment, end quote, and for the lack of a proper review process that, quote, would ensure more relevant charges, end quote. The Deputy Attorney General's memorandum to Louis Free, the director of the FBI, charged that Hohen should not have rejected the Marshal's plan to negotiate surrender terms with Weaver. The Justice Department further found that the U.S. Attorney's Office, quote, drafted an inappropriately broad and aggressive indictment, end quote, which in plain words means they should have not thrown in the kitchen sink and asked for the death penalty. I am told that Hohen at this time is no longer prosecuting criminal cases and instead is employed by the Civil Division of the United States Attorney's Office. No disciplinary action has been taken against him, as far as we know. The Justice Department further found that the assumptions of the federal officers concerning Weaver, quote, that he was a former Green Beret, that he would shoot on sight anyone who attempted to arrest him, that he had collected certain types of arms, that he had booby-trapped and tunneled his property, exaggerated the threat he posed, unquote. Eugene F. Glenn, the on-site commander at Ruby Ridge, was censured for his, quote, inadequate performance as on-site commander, end quote, in approving the new rules of engagement and for his failure to adequately and personally address the poor working relationship with the United States Attorney's Office. He received a 15-day suspension and was removed from his field command. 
The FBI claims Richard Rogers voluntarily left the hostage rescue team. He was assigned to field work. He was also suspended for 10 days. The Department of Justice, despite the killing of two innocent people, a mother and a son, did not choose to prosecute anyone. Yet the same government was only too eager to prosecute two of its citizens who had committed no legal wrongs at all and was willing to manufacture and secrete evidence to accomplish the same. At this writing, Glenn claims that Larry Potts, then the assistant director of the FBI, was fully aware of the new shoot-on-sight rule of engagement adopted for Ruby Ridge, and that Potts signed off on it, a claim which Potts now denies. Glenn identifies two other witnesses high up in the FBI who support his assertion. The FBI agent in charge of this internal investigation, one Charles Matthews III, found that, quote, the rules of engagement are considered unconstitutional. Therefore, there is no need to further discuss them, end quote. Potts was censured for failure to clearly define the rules of engagement and then promptly promoted to deputy director of the FBI. The clear message to all in government and elsewhere was that if an agent of the FBI aborts the law by decree and such an unconstitutional act results in the killing of innocent people, especially if the people harbor beliefs different from our own, those responsible persons at headquarters will be promoted, and those in the field who carry out the killing will only be censured and given a few days' vacation without pay. Lon Horiuchi, the trigger man, received neither suspension nor censure. This all happened in 1993 and 1994. Then in April of 1995 came the shocking, cowardly bombing at Oklahoma City. That explosion has once more thrust the Randy Weaver case into the national forefront, along with a profusion of political and philosophical questions. The fact that Weaver's name continues to be mentioned in light of Oklahoma City suggests that he still is associated, erroneously, with far-right violence, and that his acquittal of all major charges at the trial has never afforded him the vindication that a man might expect to enjoy who has been found not guilty by a jury of his peers. Instead, Randy Weaver has been viciously tarred and feathered by the government and the media, both in and out of the courtroom. After the Oklahoma horror... After the broken bodies of the dead babies were held up for the people to see, and the tired, brave men dug for many days against the rubble, mining for the dead, and after the weeping and the crippled and the white-sheeted corpses on the gurneys were pushed up before us on the screens day after day, and we joined in the shock and the sorrow, the media persons, most of whom had given little thought to the meaning of the Weaver case, began to ask their standard questions, often skimmed from the surface of their minds. The vacant-headed notion that popped up in the minds of many media persons like Thistle after an early spring rain held that Randy Weaver was in some way related to that fearsome mob of neo-revolutionists who were lurking out there somewhere and who were responsible for the bombing, radical crazies who were joined at the mine's hip in a fearsome underground conspiracy fanned by a common wind of hatred against the government. And this idea led, as if in step, to the conclusion that everyone who had ever expressed enmity of one kind or another against the government were likely of the same criminal ilk as the bombers in Oklahoma City, whoever they were. And therefore, Randy Weaver must somehow be connected to them, if not in fact, then in spirit. Ideas can be as criminal as criminals. Ideas can be vicious and evil and lurk on the borders of reason and they can strike the innocent. Almost immediately this outlaw of an idea began to ply its poisonous stuff. That is the idea that any who were distressed with the government in the past were to now be viewed as suspect, as the dangerous element within. President Clinton, seeking to be seen at last as a resolute and timely leader, promised the nation that the bombers would be arrested forthwith. Then he led the nation's new inquisition by suggesting that all that mean talk from the far right, where his most vocal enemies lay, had probably encouraged renegades such as the Oklahoma bombers to do their evil deed. And those who called themselves constitutionalists and tax protesters and people who called themselves patriots and those who were members of the militia and many other fringes on both the right and the left became the victims of the new paranoia. 
Waco is even more in the news than the Weaver case, as the media tied the Oklahoma City bombing to the second anniversary date of the Waco Holocaust, in which 19 children and scores of adults were burned to cinders. But the Waco crazies, so-called, were cultists, were they not? The Branch Davidians had resisted the federal officers, and several federal officers themselves had been killed, which seemed to lessen the tragedy that innocent children had been burned alive like baby lambs on fiery spits. No one spoke, not Ms. Reno, the Attorney General, not anyone, about how you could hear the screams of the little children through the flames, and how the smell of burning children had stifled the air and spoiled American history. In the wake of Oklahoma City, the President called for more power, more power for the FBI. He wanted a thousand more men, and he wanted to use the Army, no less, in situations like Oklahoma City. And he wanted more power to tap our phones and to invade our privacy. He wanted express authority from Congress to infiltrate the fringe groups, and in short, to snoop and to peer and to spy on the citizenry, especially on those who held different beliefs from those that flow in the murky mainstream of America. But the question remains, will we really be safer with a thousand more or a hundred thousand more FBI agents armed with even greater power? We must be careful. These are dangerous times. When we are afraid, we want to be protected. And since we cannot protect ourselves against such horrors as mass murder by bombers, we are tempted to run to the government, a government that is always willing to trade the promise of protection for our freedom. This leaves, as always, the question, how much freedom are we willing to relinquish for such a bald promise? The world has indeed changed, but as the world changes, our fervent love of freedom must not change. The federal police are not composed of the Andy Sutkas of the country. Perhaps none of the police ever were. Lord Acton Sage rejoinder still endures. Power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. When we face the tragedy of the Oklahoma City bombing, one of our first concerns becomes our protection. Protect us, we beseech the government. Protect us, the people, from our enemies, from the fringes, from the radicals and the crazies. Protect us from those who bear arms, from those who believe differently than we, from those we fear, whether we fear with justification or not. Protect us from our neighbors, from aliens, from terrorists. Protect us from everyone, including ourselves. And the government, the embodiment of power that yearns always for more power, responds... Give the government more of your freedom. Freedom is the price you must pay for your safety. Let us tap your phones more easily. Let us warrants. Let us snoop and spy on you and your families and your neighbors. Let us have more police. Give the government more power. And out of the ethos, if one were to listen, one might hear the high, sweet voices of Vicky and little Sammy whispering, Listen once more to our story. Power is a dreadful disease. We were the victims of power. We were murdered by power. Give the government more agents? More agents to entrap you and to frighten you, to oppress you, and to tell all measure of untruths against you, and at last more agents to murder you and to prosecute your family for crimes they did not commit? Or perhaps if you listen, you will hear nothing. But have we not already identified the enemy of freedom? The enemies of freedom are not the fringes and the radicals and the crazies or those who want to own guns. We are the enemy. Our fear is the enemy. Our fear that would allow a couple of lunatic bombers at Oklahoma City to corner 250 million of us with fear, in response to which, in exchange for the bald promise of protection, we are petitioned by the government to abdicate our freedom and renounce our sacred rights as free people. Out of the story of the trial of Randy Weaver, like distant prophetic words from the firmament, emerges a wise and warning voice. We must listen to this voice. 
a voice often muffled by the shock and anger and fear we suffer as the products of that Oklahoma horror. The lesson of the Weaver trial must never become the vindication of Weaver's beliefs, but instead the need of all Americans freely to believe as they will, without risk of persecution by a government or by a majority or by a power clique. And to preserve this precious birthright, we must dedicate our constant attention, our unmitigated courage, and our purest, full energy. The enemy is, indeed, our fear of mad dogs like those who struck at Oklahoma City. Yet there have always been mad dogs in our society who will attack the innocent flock. But will there not also always be the willing, waiting wolf, the hungry wolf standing by who will offer to protect us from the mad dogs, if only we will deliver ourselves to the wolf? Eternal vigilance is still the price of freedom. Eternal vigilance, and today more than ever, courage. For now, as always, it takes courage to remain free. We are trapped, trapped in our symbiotic relationship with both the living and the dead, with both our dependence on nature and our subservience to corporate America. We must preserve the earth, lest we destroy ourselves. Yet we are dependent upon and still serve the most powerful tyrant in the history of the world, a tyrant bent on the destruction of the earth for profit. We are the new Indians. At the time our Native Americans were vanquished, they cried out in impotent rage as their land, their mountains and streams, their great buffalo herds, their beaver and deer and elk were wrested from them, and they themselves were herded in desolate reservations. Once confined to their reservations, they became dependent on the white man for their sustenance, not unlike our confinement today in the megacities where we too are dependent on our corporate masters for survival. The white man gave the Indian trinkets and beads and Christianity and plows and, of course, fire, water, and disease. We have been provided Bud and Miller and Coors as symbols of happiness and Marlboros as symbols of manhood and freedom. We have been sold sickness and death. We have been furnished with every kind and character of machine, with every gadget and thing the mind can concoct. And to pay for the same, in the interest the banks demand, we have been sentenced to work in places where people ought not to work, and to labor for corporate objectives that are contrary to the best interests of the earth and her inhabitants. Although he committed no crimes, the Indian was sentenced to work as the white man worked. Smohala, the great teacher of the Nez Perce, cried out, My young men shall never work. Men who work cannot dream, and wisdom comes to us in dreams. You ask me to plow the ground, shall I take a knife and tear my mother's breast? You ask me to dig for stone, shall I dig under her skin for her bones? Then when I die, I cannot enter her body to be born again. You ask me to cut grass and to make hay and to sell it and to be rich like white men. But how dare I cut off my mother's hair? We are the new Indians. I remember how my father worked for the railroad with my mother helping at home. They were able to provide for us. We lived in a small Wyoming town. Like the Indian women who made jerky and pemmican, my mother gardened and canned the vegetables as well as the trout we caught in the streams. Canned, the trout tasted like salmon. The turnips and carrots went into the root cellar for winter. We had chickens. I remember how we hatched the chicks by the warmth of light bulbs in a box that we set near the furnace. The excess eggs went into water glass, as it was called, and were preserved for the bitter winter months when the hens stopped laying. 
we kept a goat in the backyard that provided our milk. It was my job to tend the goat and to see that she got plenty of good green grass that grew along the edges of the alleys. We were Indians in the way we lived. My father hunted. We lived all winter on the deer and elk and antelope he brought home, and we shared it with neighbors who had no hunting fathers. My mother made my winter coat out of the tanned hides of elk and deer and my mittens out of the lighter skins of antelope. I remember how my father felt about the great outdoors. Sometimes my mother would scold that we should go to church, when instead in the summer we went fishing, and in the fall our family moved to the mountains in our tent to hunt. My father would reply, A person can worship God a good deal better out in God's church, by which he meant the mountains, than in some man-made stuffy building in town. And I thought he was right. Yet in other ways I was not Indian. Born in town, in captivity, when I was alone in the mountains, I often felt afraid. I remember when my father would take me hunting, and when I was too young to keep up with him, as he stayed on the track of a deer in new snow, sometimes he would deposit me in a safe place like the doe leaves her fawn. Stay here, he would say, pointing to a group of fallen logs along the trail that provided shelter. I'll come back for you. Don't leave me alone, I'd cry. I was eight or ten. I'm afraid. I remember looking in every direction. There was nothing civilized in sight. No roads, no houses, no people. Only mountain unfolding on mountain. In the silence of the forest, there were no sounds except the chatter of a squirrel or the occasional scolding of a jay. You're safe here. You're in the mountains, my father would say. For a child who lived in town, the mountains were wild. But to my father, who was born in the mountains, they were wondrous and safe. He was a part of them. The only thing a man needs to be afraid of is other men, my father said. And there aren't any men up here. Bad men are too lazy to come this far. To my father, like the Indian, nature was neither wild nor hostile. Nature was as safe and warm as mother. After the Second World War, things changed. Millions of people were forced to the cities in search of work. Farms and small farming communities were abandoned. Like the Indians from whom the people had once taken the land, the people were now forced to give it up, this time to the new king, this time to corporate farming, corporate land developers, and to new industries that wrested the land from them. Where before the Indian needed nothing except what was readily available from the earth, now he was taught that he needed houses, and plumbing, and automobiles, and beer. We too were taught new needs. Our families no longer raised a garden in the backyard and canned our own produce. We bought our food from Safeway. We bought deep freezes and filled them with frozen products from corporate farming. We no longer picked berries in the fall and ate wild game all winter long. We bought steaks fattened on corn and began to die of obesity and heart attacks. It was no longer lawful to keep a goat tethered in the alley. We bought dairy products produced by corporate farms and marketed by corporate associations, and our coats and mittens were manufactured in foreign countries. Like the Indians imprisoned on the reservation, we soon forgot how to live on the earth. Our fathers were no longer able to earn the family's living. We therefore sent our mothers out of the home to work to pay for the trinkets and the gadgets, the second automobile, and the automatic washing machine and dryer and television set and telephones, the boats and campers and on and on. In the meantime, we sent our children to daycare so that in the end we traded our mothers for the gadgetry we had been trained to covet. As their land was taken from them, the Indians cried out in deep sorrow. We hear the same cries now from our farmers who have lost their farms to banks and from our ranchers who have had to cut up their holdings into small ranchettes and sell them to eastern moneyed men who come in the summer, don their cowboy hats and their spurs, and ride a fancy purebred horse in the Fourth of July parade. We hear the same Indian cry from those left behind in deserted villages when their neighbors have been shipped off to the cities. We hear the same cry from the small businessmen in the towns who have been systematically replaced by non-resident corporate franchises. Indeed, we are the new Indians. Entrapped in our concrete reservations, 
indentured to our corporate masters, impoverished of our land, separated from the earth, and at last placed at odds with nature herself, many no longer see the issue of freedom as relevant. For them the ring of the Liberty Bell has long ago been silenced, and having lost our connection with our Mother Earth, we have lost our connection with ourselves. I think again of my childhood. I am sitting alone on the log in the wilderness waiting for my father to return. I am lost. I do not know where our camp lies, nor how far. I am afraid. The sun is growing low over the horizon. The cold bite of evening begins to settle in. I wiggle my toes against my boot soles to keep them warm. New shivers begin to make their way along my ribs. I feel panic. Then I see my father coming. He has a great smile on his face. He has been all day on the trail of a deer, and there is fresh blood on his hands, which is good news, for he has been successful. I shout with joy, Daddy, Daddy! Well, I see you're just fine, he says, as if he'd been gone for only minutes. I was afraid something had happened to you and that you wouldn't come back. Well, I told you there's nothing to be afraid of here, he said. And I was right, wasn't I? He smiles at me and waits for my answer. This is the end of Side 2. From Freedom to Slavery continues on the next tape, Side 3.